are here to give you some local voices and some local perspectives. Um, my name is Brooke. I work at the Watershed Center. I'm Ben. Um, I run White Pine Community Farm in Wingdale. I am LJ, and I also work at the Watershed Center. In addition to working with Kite's Nest, who's in the house, and the NECC, who's in the house, and uh, Rail Retreat Project in Great Barrington. So we are going to just um, each talk a little bit about work that we've been involved in related to the film, and then just open it up to discussion. Um, so um, I just wanted to, I'm going to start. I, I uh, work at the Watershed Center now, but I've been a political activist for about 20 years. And actually, um, my first um, entrance into that work was doing, was doing environmental work um, in a logging community in Oregon. Um, that was my first arrest, was blockading a, a, um, the cutting down of a, of a logging area in Mount Hood National Forest. Um, but more recently, about seven years ago, I went with Naomi Klein to Copenhagen to one of the UN climate conferences. And um, it was actually quite an eye-opener for me. And it's interesting to see all that she managed to get into this film and, and also how much she's been involved in that didn't make it into this film. Um, and in particular, the climate conferences are pretty fascinating. In, in many ways due to their futility on the inside and the power of the social movements that are on the outside of these climate conferences. It's particularly interesting now as the whole world is looking towards Paris um, in December, which LJ is going to be talking about, because LJ is actually going, um, as you know, a, a moment of sort of global solution to, or the potential for a solution to the climate crisis, which most people who are involved in know that that's probably the last thing that will actually happen there. Um, in large part because in my experience of being with Naomi, we were on the inside of the climate conference and it was a, it was a sort of an eye-opening affair of seeing the, um, the richer na nations just bullying the poorer nations. And um, as was quite clear in this movie, um, it's those that are the least responsible for climate change, the poorer nations that are um, feeling the effects the, the the first uh, that are the hardest hit and the, the most immediately hit by climate change and have the least voice in the solution. And what a lot of these um, uh, lesser developed nations are calling for is a, a global fund funded by the richer nations who created the problem and that it be democratically allocated. But the, the more wealthy nations on the inside of these climate conferences are blocking that democratic proposal because they know that they can use this moment of climate crisis in the same way that we've used the IMF and the World Bank to essentially hold um, developing nations captive by saying, if you don't play by our rules and open up your markets to us, we're not going to bail you out of the crisis you're in. And um, it was actually quite chilling when I was there. It was actually Hillary Clinton that sort of delivered that message the most blatantly. And as I watch her up on the stage now, I just I can't help but really feel um, the fear that I felt at her saying, actually, no, we're, we're, we're not going to be standing for a democratic solution to this. The United States is going to decide who they dole out um, climate funds to. And, and in every way, they're going to use that to block um, nations from actually coming together to demand for a more um, a solution to this mess. Um, and uh, I wanted to also discuss you know, I, I felt in this film, you know, I think there's a lot of hope in renewable, in the sort of the move towards renewable struggle, uh, towards renewable um, energy solutions. Um, but for the past seven years, I've been involved in a struggle in Oaxaca, um, which is um, the area of Mexico where the uh, Atlantic and the Pacific are closest. And because of this, it's a very skinny area, it's a wind tunnel. And it's one of the highest wind resources in the world. And because of that, multinationals have been flocking to Oaxaca and building wind farms all over the place, but doing it without the consent of the local communities, often working with cartels and um, giving local farmers, many of whom don't speak, don't read Spanish, um, documents that they can't understand and basically creating contracts that are never ending where they get $20 a year for you know these 
multi-million dollar project. And, um, and it just um, goes to show that even these green solutions in the hands of a capitalist market can go the same direction as, um, as the fossil fuels industry. And there's a lot of resistance. The indigenous communities there, the Zapotec communities have been fighting this, um, this proliferation of global wind and calling for um, community-owned wind farms, which is the project that I've been involved in which is creating the first um, indigenous-owned wind farm so that they actually have the ability to do proper studies around, um, around the environment and, and place them in a way that isn't going to be harmful to their own communities. And just watching the sort of onslaught of even green energy, um, if done improperly, is going to create civil unrest. Um, uh, uh, situations where you've got people in Oaxaca who've already been killed around this particular um, land grab, um, and also a much slower transition. So, um, yeah, I think that um, I was really thrilled to see the end of this movement really putting forth um, the need for people to stand up in this moment and to, to um, not necessarily look at what our rights have been, because a lot of our governmental uh, structures are set up around the, the primacy of property and, and protecting capital and actually set, standing up for the rights of, of communities in the earth. So with that, I'll pass it over to Ben. Um, yeah, so I'm Ben. I, I also, was also involved in the Northwest, um, living up in trees, in old growth mm -hmm. trees. And um, yeah, it's, it's been a really an inspiring journey, but um, uh, also in Mirror Brook, I know, I know of a struggle in Honduras with putting in hydroelectric dams in an indigenous community. It's not like they don't want the dams, they just want to be respected. It's their land, they've been living there for thousands of years. Um, and currently they manage to actually drive off the developers and put it in a different site. Um, and we set up a radio station uh, for them to help organize their communities around uh, the dam project. Um, so, and then I'm, I'm here tonight um, because I'm um, launching a campaign um, around uh, cr the Cricket Valley Energy, which is in Dover. Um, they're bringing in um, a uh, fracking gas power plant here to the Harlem Valley. And um, the community in, in Dover and Wingdale desperately needs a tax dollar. So I think what we're working to uh, set the message we're, we're, we're sending to Cricket Valley Energy is that we should be using um, wind turbines and solar panels um, in that project as opposed to uh, Pennsylvania fracked gas. And it just seems strange that we would have a, a fracked gas power plant here in New York State where we banned fracking gas. And so why would we be using that power um, to, uh, to power New York State? Um, I and I think it would you know, probably, you know, there's, there's better solutions for the Harlem Valley. So we're having our first meeting on November 11th. And I also have a um, little we'll sign up sheet if you guys, you know, some people don't use email and that sort of thing. So if you guys want to your phone numbers or whatever, or, or just anyone who wants to get involved can write down their information here. And I can send out like a mass email or call people if that works better. Yeah, and I don't know. Um, Tony, do you want to talk a little bit more about cricket energy? I'd rather do it later after. Yeah, after. sure. Maybe just pass it on to you. Um, <clears throat> so I, um, I have also been a polit political activist for quite some time and have also like Brooke been involved in supporting indigenous communities who are living on the front lines of climate change. And um, one place that I've done a lot of work in has been Barrow, Alaska. And Barrow, Alaska is the northernmost point of North America. It's, um, it's basically beachside on the Arctic Ocean. Um, so it's, it's very much right on the front lines of climate change. And I have been working on a project um, that's based in New York City, but a collaboration with, um, with the Inupiaq village in Barrow, Alaska for, um, for almost 
seven years now, and I've really learned through that work um, about the necessity of having um, ritual and art and um, collective reflection as a way of moving through a lot of the feelings that come up around climate change. And so I really appreciate it in this film having Naomi walk us through her process of, of feeling like she wants to turn the, the channel um, and turn off what she's seeing and what's coming up for her around that. And so what I'm here to invite everyone to this evening is to participate in a project called the Climate, Rib the Climate Ribbon Project. Um, and the climate, climate Ribbon is a little bit of a tongue twister, um, but is an art project that evolved out of the People's Climate March in New York City last fall and has been traveling around the world and is going to Paris in November and December for the UN Convention on Climate Change. And we would love to show you a very, very brief video that Walter at the Watershed Center made um, just to give you a, a minute or two of backstory before we invite everybody in to participate um, in that process. So Kyle, if you could run the tape. 